This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Baglin. In summer, bears like to roam. And one place they show up, maybe more than anywhere, is in the news. Are these human interest stories simply because we don't see these creatures that often? We know this. Bears are creatures of habit. And we go inside outdoors this week with a man in charge of bear research in Kentucky to take a look at bears and to better understand bear behavior. By the end of the show, you will be bear aware. It's all next on Kentucky Field Radio. That fish weighed 10 pounds. 10. That's the magic word. Honey, I hadn't been there 10 minutes. If he says 10, he's lying. And he says 10 a lot. You got to be happy you married me. I can hear it coming. Admit it. I'm your perfect 10. Honey, why don't you take 10? Tenfold. Your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, fishing's not about math. It's about fun. And fudge it a little if you need to. Kentucky Fishing. Be honest. It'll make a liar out of you. Skipper! 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 I don't know what you mean by skipper. Skipper? Skipper! 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 Hey, Skipper! What? Don't skip the life jackets. Life jackets? You're right. Thanks for the reminder. Water officers everywhere remind you, your life jackets got your back. And the backing of everyone that wants you to come home alive. So, Skipper, don't skip the life jackets. A public service message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Baglin here, and welcome to Kentucky Field Radio. In the summer, bears like to roam, and they'll show up in the oddest places. But one place they often show up that they don't really need to is in the news. Bears have no interest in people. It's not like they're seeking us out. They just tend to wander, finding their range, finding mates. And if one shows up someplace, chances are it'll wander off fairly quickly, much like a rabbit or raccoon would. And if any of the news reports from over the summer have thrown a scare into you, it shouldn't have. Always helps to keep this in perspective. And we have invited Mr. Stephen Doby, who is the state black bear biologist with the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, to chat about bears and bear behavior. Are you ready to talk about black bears a little bit more as if you have not talked enough about bears yet this summer. You got that right. You've talked to a lot of news media about bears. This summer, maybe more so than any in your tenure with the Department of Fish and Wildlife? I'd say so, yeah. We've had a lot of bear activity this year, and usually it's concentrated kind of in the core area, our our eastern mountain counties. But this year we've had a lot of bears showing up in places outside of that area. I remember in June of 2014, couldn't turn on the local news, and they were talking about bears. And uh, what are bears doing in in the warmer months? Well, two well, really three important things are going on. We've got the family units in May begin breaking up. The female with the young of the year, those yearling bears, they're being kicked out, dispersed. They're on their own for the first time. The females, not much of an issue. They don't roam much at all. The young male bears, they roam extensively. They are moving all over the place, trying to just establish their own home range. And number two, in June, the breeding season begins. So what happens there, again, females aren't moving much, but the males are just all over the place uh, looking for females to breed. And so they roam extensively. The, our males, we're talking about home ranges of 250 square kilometers, which is in, just, in English. I don't know what a I'd square to, kilometer is. I'd have to Google it. and Go, find out. Google a square kilometer. Could, you, could we guess? Is a square kilometer about uh, two-thirds of a square mile? A kilometer and a mile, I think, is at point six two. Challenge when it comes to converting these things without my iPhone. Let's That's see. his iPhone out. 250 square kilometers is about 66,000 acres. That's one annual home range for an adult male bear. So he's out there hoofing it. Yeah. Yeah, they cover a lot of area. That's for sure. So he wants to know what's there and find girl bears there. Mm-hmm. So who is it that is actually measuring this in kilometers, and where are they from? Is that something that scientists do? Do you use the metric system and then convert to the English system? Yeah, typically. It's just out of habit for research purposes and, and um, scientific literature. It's usually in kilometers. So that, metric that means that you're speaking the same language as, say, Canada, 
or England <laughs> or wherever it may be. You know, the, the international audience is all speaking a, the same language. Yeah, internationally, when we read out of the literature, they want it in something that expands the borders, and the metric system does that, even though we typically don't use it much in the U.S. But 250 square kilometers is 96 square miles. But a bear knows and that, he doesn't 60, even have to pull out his iPhone. That's right. <laughs> they just know to keep walking. <laughs> that's, a, that's the only thing they know to do, keep walking. And So we've got those family units breaking up in May, and then the breeding season begins in June. And during that whole time, until about mid-July, natural foods are very limited across the landscape. Berries haven't really come on yet. In addition to moving for natural biological reasons, family breakup and, and breeding, they're having to move to look for food. Bears are eternally optimistic creatures. They will all it's got to be better around the next bit ridge ridge. Um, but they're looking if they're not in the early in the year, April, May, into June, grasses, insects turn into logs, eating ants, grubs, digging up yellow jacket nests, and then of course, human related foods um, do come into play because they're moving so much, just the likelihood of them encountering people, that being homes and garbage cans, really increases. And so that's the, what we we typically see. May and June are our busiest months of the year when it comes to bears. Will a bear raid a garden like a rabbit would? It, it, they have. We've documented that before, but uh, it, it doesn't happen too often. Those gardens typically don't have much of a smell to them, so there's not much of a lure to get them there in the first place. Now, if they get in there and a tomato falls in their mouth and they like it, they may keep <laughs> devouring all the tomatoes. But uh, they won't actively, typically don't actively seek out gardens. So a bear is an omnivore, Absolutely. meaning it eats a lot of stuff. eats a lot of stuff, which is pretty amazing considering how active they are in moving and how large they can become, especially in the winter before they den, with a diet that's almost probably 95, 98% plant matter. That's 95 to 98 percent plants. Yeah. Well, so you throw in a few grubs and moles and insects. So that would be a carnivorous diet. Yeah. That's where they get their meat. Mm-hmm. In there, nowhere have you mentioned people or pets. They, yeah. they, they don't. People may seem to think, "Oh no, he's coming after me." And are they or are they not? No. Uh, bear attacks, black bear attacks in particular on humans are extremely rare. Bears are not very tolerant of people. They don't want to be around people. And and a lot of the attacks, you know, across the, the, the U.S., the few that have happened, it's been a product of usually two things. It's it's some kind of nuisance-related behavior, and the bears not, has no fear of people, and maybe is in a garbage, in a... In a, in a Garage, you know, getting into some garbage, and someone comes out in there and startles it, and they get mauled. That mm-hmm. that has happened. Or, again, black bears are wild animals, and and carnivores eat meat. We're meat. Bears will just flat out prey on people. Um, we have had instances across the U.S. where um, that has been confirmed, but that's extremely rare. Usually, just yelling, throwing rocks, something as simple as that, enough to scare a bear off. There's a bunch of different types of bears. Mm-hmm. The only bear that I've ever learned that really isn't a bear is a koala bear. Mm-hmm. Koala is just a, not a bear at all. It's just a koala. Yeah. A marsupial, I take it more like kangaroo than it would be a bear. Panda, is that a real bear? Pandas are very different physiologically, and the reproductive strategy is pretty different. The bears that people are familiar with, in Kentucky, that's a black bear. That's correct. The American black bear. We have we meaning in on this continent, um, grizzly bears, brown bears, Kodiak bears, polar are, bears. Are there polar bears? They're concentrated generally in uh, Canada, Alaska, parts of Russia. Um, it's a really cool animal. They're not uh, sadly, their habitat is declining rapidly. Um, there's even potential that they could go extinct. God, I and see that. human generation or two, but uh, they're the most carnivorous of all the bears. Let's sort of line these up. If we have black bears in Kentucky that have real no interest in eating you or me, they're going to go after blackberries. Yep. But if they're eating 97, 98% plant matter, then that means they don't want to take a bite out of my leg. Nah. But what bear does? Hands down, the brown bear. Brown, Where are brown bears? Uh, Western U.S. 
lots of high concentrations in parts of Alaska, um, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho. That's a pretty bad animal. Do they look a lot like our black bear except they're brown? There are some definite differences. They tend to have, their, number one, they're just larger. They tend to have a, a, a hump on their back. Their face is a little more dish-shaped, much longer, straighter claws. Um, there'd be no mistaking if you put a brown bear beside a black bear. They're larger? Yes, yes. It's plain talk about bears. Which ones are out to get you and which ones could really care less? I'm Charlie Baglin. We're talking to Stephen Doby. Back with more after the break on Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. We're talking to Stephen Doby, the state's black bear biologist. He's the man. He's the fella you have seen over the summer talking about bears on TV news. And as Kentucky bears go, they are on the smaller side of bears, 400 pounds, maybe 500 pounds. We had a gentleman bring a Kodiak skull in to be scored recently. That was, that was impressive. 1,400 pounds. 1,400 pounds. That's just a mass of... They're on a Kodiak island of Alaska, and they're kind of isolated, really high salmon concentrations, and they just get massive. So you have the brown bear that w- that would eat a person. Absolutely. In their absence, in people's absence, what do the brown bears eat anyway? Um, much like the their black bear cousins, lots of vegetation, berries, grasses, depending on the time of the year, but they're also foraging on fish, big salmon runs that you often see on television. Bears, Brown bears take a advantage of that and they prey on uh, other mammals they'll stalk and prey on ungulates deer elk things of that nature holy cow gonna take down an elk it's happened before that's a big bad bear yes it is (laughs) we're talking about kodiak bears now they eat mostly salmon but will they go after an elk or mule deer or what what will they find in alaska about the only thing that a bear doesn't see as food is granite caribou I think they'd eat just about anything if they could get their 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 claws around it. Brown bears, that is. And a polar bear that in the North Pole, they eat... The food in the North Pole is very scarce. So what is it they eat? Seals. And their diet is almost exclusively meat, as compared to some of the other bear species. If someone came along on a dog sled, are they vulnerable? I doubt it. In the winter, they'd be out in the dog sled. Bears would be denning. Oftentimes in areas where you have bear concentrations, if there's a lot of winter activity of humans, it's not a concern just because the nature of bears, they're denning. So we have polar bears, Kodiak, brown bears, grizzly bears we haven't mentioned. Now, you don't want to cross paths with a grizzly. No, I wouldn't. No. And th- <laughs> are they exclusively meat eaters? No, no. They're omnivores as well. Um, very much like the Kodiaks and grizzlies there. James, same general species, and there's some subspecies differentiation between those, depending on where they're located. There was a time I was on a trip to Denali National Park in Alaska. We also call that Mount McKinley. And it's way back in there. You get on what looks like an old school bus that's uh, four-wheel drive, and they take tours of people back in there. It may take two, three, four hours to drive back in there where you can get a better glimpse of McKinley. Mm -hmm. Along the way, you will see all type of wildlife. Have you made this trip? Not yet. You will. Yes. But caribou among them, grizzly bears are there. And you will sight these things. They will cross in front of the road in front of you. We stopped, and they said, hey, there are two grizzly bear cubs over there. And the cubs came over to the bus and were sort of like reaching up. If we had food, we could have reached out of the windows. You don't want to do that. But we could have almost reached out and petted them. Mm -hmm. These little cub grizzlies were curious. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Mama Bear was, Mm -hmm. but probably not far. And the bus driver was saying, leave your hands inside. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bear bills. Anybody that's been out west where there's bear country, they sell these things, and a lot of people look at them thinking that they're just souvenirs or novelties, but they're called bear bills. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like a jingle bill Mm -hmm. that you just strap onto your backpack or your belt, and it makes a little bit of noise. Yes. And so as you go along, it makes bears know that somebody's afoot, somebody's coming, it sort of scares them away. Have you heard of these? Mm Mm-hmm. 
Do they work? Yeah. The bell itself is not designed to scare a bear away, but like you mentioned, it's just it's designed to make the bear aware that someone's out there. That's what you don't want to happen, and especially if you're hiking out west. We're talking about grizzly bears. Um, you don't want to be hiking and surprise a bear or a female with cubs. And so wearing that bell make, or making a lot of noise, it just a means to alert that bear that, hey, someone's coming around the corner and the bear will probably take off. So just to minimize chances of encounters. There's an old joke that you know, if you're out west, how do you tell the difference between black bear and grizzly bear scat? The grizzly bear scat has bells in it and it smells like bear spray. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, they don't bother hikers too much. What has been documented out west increasingly, it's pretty interesting, is grizzly bears in areas where high densities of elk hunters, they have documented grizzly bears associating gunshots with a food reward. So grizzly bears out there, here's a gunshot, is curious, goes and checks it out, and lo and behold, finds this delicious elk, dead elk laying at his feet and eats it, gets a free meal. And they put two and two together, so gunshot equals dead elk. And in some areas out west, you have that happening, and you have to be very careful in the fact that if you kill an elk, you have to get to it pretty quickly because some bears are associating those that hunter presence with a meal. Bears have a grand sense of smell. Absolutely. Do they smell better than, let's say, a turkey can see? Compare it to something. I'd say that's a pretty good analogy. They they can it's just phenomenal what they can smell. They can turn it off and on when they want to. Um, I've witnessed myself been out in the woods in the fall tracking research animals and seeing bears in the woods with a radio collar and tracking to them and watching them feed in the fall months when they're keying in on like acorns and they just get like a search image for these acorns and they'll either be up in the trees or on the ground walking in their nose to the ground like a vacuum cleaner, just sucking up every conceivable acorn they come across. And they're so tunnel visioned on acquiring that food source that they don't even know, they don't pay attention to, I had an instance where I've been 10 feet from a bear and never lift its head up. But it's just so focused, But which isn't necessarily a good thing. I mean, I was in a situation where it was con- relatively controlled and I was safe, but if you know, you're out in the woods, you don't want to sneak up on a bear like that and play the old game, hey, let's see how close we can get. Mm-hmm. Not a wise thing to, to scare a bear because um, they have some pretty formidable claws. Generally, black bears aren't an issue, but no biologist is going to recommend people trying to approach black bears. People who study black bears, and I've known a few, and basically from the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife, Mike Orlando, probably of the bear biologist I know who is now, I think, in Florida. He is. Is probably the largest black bear biologist that I've ever met. And even he wasn't a big fella. And you and I are about the same size. We're just regular, normal people. If I saw you coming down the street, I wouldn't think that you were a black bear biologist, a bear specialist. I would, If I'm looking for a bear specialist, I'm looking for Grizzly Adams. <laughs> I want somebody who's six six that can cut down a tree with one swing of an axe, a big, thick beard. You know the type. With the best, you can uh-huh. sort of picture this person. That would be my idea of somebody, if they needed to, they could wrestle with the bear and maybe win. Mm-hmm. Easiest way to identify a bear biologist is it's the guy that's rubbing his temples and his hair's turning gray. <laughs> that's a bear biologist because they, are, they cause a lot of issues. It's the people that they live with that cause most of the issues, but it's just a matter of adapting to bears. And I say adapting because you know, states like Virginia, Tennessee, West Virginia, North Carolina, they've had bears forever. People know what to do, what not to do. And here in Kentucky, it is very different because, you know, even just 20 years ago, you know, bears just weren't a concern. Um, when I came here in 2005, we didn't even have a bear program. Um, that's how fast our population has kind of grown, and we've got some great field staff that do some really good work educating the public, and that's a big part of it right now. You kind of have to be there, walk the walk, talk the talk, to be able to criticize living in bear country. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling a lot of people live in bear country never see bears. Some people see them routinely. Yeah. Most of the people I'm guessing, again, I'm not there, but I'm guessing, know how to live with bears. And a lot of the news media that came out earlier in 2014, is it even fair to say might have been overdone? Because there is some, if there's some fear of bears out there, they have a duty 
to alert mm-hmm. the public. But do you think it might have been overdone? Um, it can be sensationalized, no doubt. Uh, it gets overblown in the media sometimes. But when a bear turns up in a place like Richmond, Berea, and it gets in a city limits, it, it, it is good to get that information out to the public because we want to be able to make sure the media is telling folks what to do, what not to do, as opposed to just kind of letting it die by the wayside. Because, it, you know, when a bear gets in city limits, it does pose some tricky scenarios. For example, the biggest thing that we have to contend with if a bear gets in city limits anywhere is, especially if it's outside of, you know, typical bear country, because it's such a, such a novelty to see a bear, is that bear, people have got to realize that bear has to have an escape route wherever it is. So you don't want to corner a bear. Exactly. Unfortunately, human nature is, hey, let's see how close we can get. And people will encroach on a bear. It may get in 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 a lot or in a fenced yard or maybe climb up a tree, which I hate seeing happen in the city limits because the first thing people do, you can guess, swarm the bottom of the tree. Oh, it's up in a tree. I'm safe now. Well, no, you just have a bear hanging over your head. Um, and now that bear has absolutely no escape route. The only escape route, if it decides to come down, is into a mass of people. You know, chances are that's not going to end well. So that's kind of the one, some of the concerns we have when bears turn up in some of these more populated areas. Stephen, we need to hold it there. Stephen Doby, the state's black bear biologist, is the guest. I'm Charlie Beglin. More after the break. This is Kentucky Field Radio. Kentucky Field Radio. I'm Charlie Bagman. If you have not signed up for our Kentucky Field Notes newsletter, it's digital. It's emailed to you once a week. You can do that by going to kyafield.com. You'll see the Kentucky Field tab. You can go down to the Kentucky Field TV show or radio show and click on the link that says sign up for the Kentucky Field newsletter. Once a week talks about what's going on on both shows so that you are in the know. Right now, it's time for our fishing report. This is Rob Rold in the Northwestern Fishery District with some fishing opportunities in our area. Largemouth bass at both rough and no land have been fairly slow the last two or three weeks. Few bass are being caught 18 to 20 foot deep using primarily soft plastics. Few fish are being caught really early in the morning on some top waters. At no end, anglers are picking up some walleye by drifting nightcrawler rigs on some of the longer main lake points. Catfish are active on both reservoirs by fishing some of the steeper rocky banks, especially in the mid to upper lake areas. At no end, bluegill are also still fairly active. On the Ohio River, striped bass, hybrid striped bass, and blue and flathead catfish are being caught below the dams. That's an update from the Northwestern Fishery District. Please remember, be safe on the water. Always wear your life jacket. Hi, this is Kevin Fry with your Eastern Area Fisheries Report. Lake fishing reports continue to be slow or poor for the daytime fishing. Top water action at dusk and dawn is still best for bass and white bass. Musky fishing has started producing good numbers of fish over 40 inches at Buckhorn Lake in the upper end near Confluence and Trace Branch. This is a typical pattern for late July and August at Buckhorn with shad massing in large numbers in cooler water. Trolling with large crankbaits and retrieving with a figure eight near boat are effective. Stream fishing reports are very good for black bass and musky. Eliza and Tug Fork having good reports for smallmouth bass and largemouth bass in some areas. Recent channel catfish stockings were at Kingdom Come Lake, Harlan County, and at Martin County Lake at Milo on July 31st. This is Tom with your fish report from the Northeast. Out on Cave Run Lake, temperatures are in the low 80s and the lake has been clear as a bell for several weeks now. We've had a few reports of musky fishing starting to pick up on the main lake with inline spinners. Anglers at Grayson Lake are reporting some good catches of the hybrid striped bass and cat fishing on jugs is just about perfect on the lake right now. Use cut up shad and fish the bongo areas for the channel cats on Grayson. The Ohio River is looking good with anglers catching some bass early on top water around woody structure and later in the day on crankbaits and plastics. You can also get into some of the catfish on the Ohio River with liver and shad fishing near Creek Mouse. Farm ponds and weight fishing are some of our local go-tos for summertime fishing. Remember when you're fishing farm ponds and most streams to ask permission before you go on someone else's land. That should do it for us in the Northeast. Wherever you go, good luck and stay safe. 
This is Kentucky Field Radio. I'm Charlie Baglin. We are discussing the movements of bears during the summer months. Stephen Doby is my guest. He is the state's black bear biologist, and we will have more after the break. Skipper! 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 I don't know what you mean by skipper. Skipper? Skipper! 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 Hey, skipper! What? Don't skip the life jackets. Life jackets. You're right. Thanks for the reminder. Water officers everywhere remind you. Your life jackets got your back. And the backing of everyone that wants you to come home alive. So, skipper... Don't skip the life jackets. A public service message from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. We are back in our second half hour with Stephen Doby, Kentucky State Black Bear Biologist, talking about before the break where bears go. And that's great if they're out doing bear things in the lone woods, but if they get into populated areas, then maybe they become a concern. And I had heard in the news where they got into a populated area called Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> One wound up in the, there's the township of Madeira, yep. in Hamilton County. That's Cincinnati. It is. But it was from Kentucky, it was determined. Were you in on that? Yes. Did you help make that determination? Yes. And how did it get from Kentucky to Madeira, Ohio? Well, again, it's all... Speculation, because the the bears, none of the bears that we've seen have been tagged or radio tagged, so we can't never say with 100% certainty. However, um, I believe it was um, it's about the third week of June, we had a bear um, turn up in uh, Robertson County, and our local the local officer um, went and checked it out, uh, met with some landowners who, in fact, showed him photos. It was a bear, um, and so he said, "Well, I'm going to ride around and check it out." He called me. And I said, hey, just see what you see. You never know. So he's out riding the back roads. Lo and behold, about 4.20 that afternoon, he called me and said, you're not going to believe this. That thing ran across the road in front of me. Hmm. So very few bears in that area, typically, visible bears at least. And he sees it, runs right across the road in front of him. And we had subsequent sighting north of there. So if you drew a line kind of where those sightings were going northward, they almost perfectly connect with the first sighting report right. in Ohio. So we can likely assume that's the same bear. And in that situation, he just swam the river. That's a long way. It is. So that makes me wonder what's going on in the head of a bear. Where are the ladies? That's He's looking for a girl bear. Yeah. And he thinks there's one in Ohio. Or he's going to go over and look. He's sadly mistaken, yes. Are there bears normally in Ohio? No. Okay, so... He wasted his time. Yeah. So he <laughs> he didn't want to go the next county over. He didn't want to go to Grant County or Pendleton County or anywhere in northern Kentucky. He said, no, I think the best route is I'll just swim this river. What's that, a mile wide? Yeah, it's, probably, it's not that far. It's not that far. I drove over it recently a couple of times visiting family up there. and it's it, Looking at it, it's surprising that a bear could swim it that effectively and come across in the same general area. But stranger things have happened. That, to me, if I were a bear and I saw a huge river like the Ohio River, I'd say that's a barrier. Maybe I should go right or left instead of straight. Yeah, and usually that is what happens. We don't have many confirmations of that happening. I've seen bears swim rivers, um, not to the extent of the Ohio River, but uh, I have seen bears swim rivers, and they're pretty darn efficient at it. And where is he now? Along his trip, did they confiscate the bear, or they nope, been no, it's, relocated? It's a hands-off approach, which is typically just what we do. We let a bear, you know, so long as it doesn't create human safety concern, um, just let let the bear be a bear. Um, June and July, bears roam; they just move all over the place. And this one just got a little off track. But typically, black bears, you know, they actually have a very pretty amazing homing instinct whatever they call quote-unquote home, um, if they're moved out of that area, they have a pretty uncanny ability to get back to those places. And if I were a parent and I had a three-year-old playing in the backyard, I could probably say, oh, I'm glad I heard that on the news. At least I'm going to bring my kid in. I don't know that that means the bear's coming after me or the bear's going to break into my house. That, to me, is overkill. Yeah. Nobody ever said that anyway. But I hope nobody would think that. And I don't know if that has ever really been an issue, has it? Even in bear country? 
Uh, it, not a real issue. It's been a perceived issue. Um, someone feels threatened or just doesn't like bears and claims they feel they were threatened and shoots a bear. We typically see that a lot during the summer. Um, a lot of bears get shot. We've had several this summer already been shot. Um, and, you know, we, we can't get in someone's mind and tell if they were absolutely threatened or if that's just a defense. But um, typically, you know, bears, when they get on these long journeys of love, I'll call it, um, sometimes they don't fare too well. Bears and roads don't get along very well. Road mortality and illegal kill are the two primary sources of mortality that we see. Increasingly hunting, because we have hunting seasons now. But A bear is on a mission. Is it very much like a deer during rut, like in the fall, mm-hmm. when Absolutely. they're looking for that doe and oh. they don't care? They will run right out in front of a Mack truck. Oh, yeah. It, are bears the same way? In June, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when you get through the breeding season and all the biologists out there that haven't pulled their hair out yet, if you get to observe bears into the fall, that same intensity and focus is very real, but it shifts over to acquiring food as opposed to acquiring a girlfriend. Uh, They just become so driven and focused for food because, you know, they den. They come out of their dens in March or April. There's not much food on the landscape. June and July, they're just the males focused on breeding, absolutely focused on breeding. They don't eat as much. They lose a lot of weight. There's a lot of uh, fighting among male black bears. Get through the breeding season, at least August, September, October, into November, four months of the year, really, for them to pack on the greatest majority of weight and fat for that denning season. So they just absolutely focus on getting any food they can down their throat in those does, fall months. Does that mean moving around too, or do they stay put well, if there's a lot growing? It depends. It depends on the food availability. And in years that I pray for every year to have a good crop of acorns, if you have a good hard mass crop, whether it be red or white, um, if it's an abundant crop, those bears, it's like a magnet. They go to where the acorns are, and they don't leave. Their home ranges absolutely shrink. They don't do a lot of movement, and they just eat, eat, and eat. Conversely, if you have a year where there's a mass failure, especially if both white and red oaks don't produce uh, much like the summer, they're just roaming all over the place. And at that time, it, it's it's a really it's a matter of life and death because they're trying to put on enough food before the denning season. And if they don't, it's a possibility they may not survive the denning season. So again, in the fall, you have harvest mortality really goes up in years of a mass failure, and you have vehicle mortality really goes up just because they're moving. People, I guess, it can get a little concerned. Do I love bears or do I hate bears? Mm-hmm. I wrestle do, with that every day. Do you like bears? Do you worry about bears? Do I you, don't worry about them. Do you I'm, have children? No. Children in your family? Yes. Friends with kids? Mm-hmm. How do they feel? Do you ever hear firsthand about they're worried for their children? Uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's you know that's human nature. Um, when it comes to bears, though, um, there's some simple steps people can take to minimize, you know, the unlikely chance that something were to happen between a bear and a child. Steve, you've known me a number of years. You know I'm in advertising. Mm-hmm. And if you talk about advertising and you want to sell somebody something or get them to sort of see things your way, you want to sell somebody on an idea. You have to start with what's already in their head. For example, if I wanted to sell you a fishing license, well, what's already in your head is that, well, i got to have it if I want to fish legally. If the conservation officer comes over and checks me for a license and I don't have it, I'm getting written up. Mm -hmm. So you start off by saying, you know, you have to have your fishing license, but that license is more than just a license. And then you educate them on what you want them to see. The few dollars that go into that put wildlife and nature educators in our schools. Or you can use it all year long, and it only costs you a nickel a day. Then you start seeing it from a different perspective, from a way maybe you have never seen it before. That's what advertising does when it's done well. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about bears, the first thing people think about when you bring up the subject of bears isn't necessarily a bear mauling. They think about gummy bears and sugar bears and teddy bears. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how we embrace bears. And you can take some of that and then build on, okay, but, you know, 
the sugar bear is not so sweet if and you sort of transition through that that's mm-hmm. just sort of the well the the elements of advertising but I, yeah i did some research going into this so here toward the end of the show we want to talk about maybe some things we should have talked about to begin with of what's already in people's minds when they think of bears gummy bears i looked this up on wikipedia 139 bears on this list of fictional bears like Smoky Bear or Yogi Bear. Talk about polar bears with Coca-Cola. That commercial is great. Oh, that whole series. And people just love bears. They do. But then they turn around and say, the bears in my backyard or the bears in the next city over, and they seem to be a little less loving when mm-hmm. it comes to talking about bears. I was looking here at literature, comics, film and television, animation, video games, Familiar with the Jungle Book? Yes. Baloo Mm -hmm. was a bear. A fine dancer, as I recall. Gentle Ben. Yes. Life and Times of Grizzly Adams. Um, The bear in that movie, or that show, was called Ben. Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. Did you see the movie Ted? Yes. It's one you won't forget if you saw it, (laughs) Talking Teddy Bear. Yes. There was a, a babe, one called Baby Bear on Sesame Street. Muppets Tonight featured Bobo the Bear. The Buddy Bears, they are from Garfield and Friends. Fozzie Bear from the Muppets. Uh-huh. Here's one. Do you watch How I Met Your Mother? You know what? I don't. They have one on there called Ring Bear. That's a mispronunciation of Ring Bearer. Uh-huh. Andy Panda, Barney Bear. Bipolar bear. Simpsons have two or three bears. Curtis E. Bear, the movie Brave, featured Eleanor. There was a bear on South Park dealt with. Let's just just leave that as educational type of bear. (laughs) I've made a list here. The the three little bears. The Charmin bears. Snuggle bear from, what's that, Snuggle fabric softener. Mm -hmm. Sugar bear, gummy bears. And my favorite, at home, in my kitchen, as we speak, cinnamon bears. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. How can something that we absolutely cherish and adore as we do inspire so much fear? We'll talk more about bears and Kentucky bears in our last segment with Steve. Stay with us. I'm Charlie Baglin. You are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. Back in our last few minutes on Kentucky Field Radio, talking with Stephen Doby, the state's black bear biologist. Steve, before we went to break, I brought up the double standard we apply to bears. Either bears are a creature that scare the pants off of us, and we fear is just as if they were a shark, or they're these sweet animals that we love to see in our cereal boxes and cartoons. Comment, please. They tend with bears to want to anthropomorphize bears. And what that means is portray human traits onto a bear. It can stand, very, very maternal, caring of young. Um, Again, that's me anthropomorphizing. Uh, But they tend to project our human sentiments onto bears. And they're cute. Get a little cub. It's adorable. Looks like a puppy. Um, But collectively, that builds a foundation in a lot of people's minds that, oh, there's a bear. How cute. Let's take it out. Let me get a little closer. It's just a cub. And and it just builds that foundation for trouble. Uh, There's not an inherent fear of bears, and there's no need to have an inherent fear, but just common sense would be nice. (laughs) Sadly, I don't have instances where we don't get much of that. But um, bears are wild animals. Um, A a white-tailed deer could kill you just as quickly as a bear could. Those things happen very infrequently, but they're wild animals. That that can happen. And uh, it would be nice if people would give those animals that respect and keeping their distance a little more so than, than, than sometimes they do. There's a bear in my backyard. Should I panic or just let it probably wander off as it would do? Anyway. No need to panic at all. Like I said, bears, if they turn it anywhere west of Daniel Boone, they're kind of outside of what I would call their normal core area. Um, so certainly call and report that bear to the Department of Fish and Wildlife because we just like the number one document where we have bears turning up in these summer months. You know, if you get a bear causing lots of problems and nobody calls, then it's going to culminate to a much bigger problem that we could have headed off early. 
what we're seeing is just the natural summer movements of bears. What we have seen in recent years is a definite increase in sightings, but what we've also seen is an increase on Facebook 100 times a day. Population expansion with bears is pretty tricky. It's, it's a very slow process. Females have very small home ranges in the range of 15 to 20 square kilometers. They spend their whole life in an area like that. And they do that because they find the best habitat, and that's where they stay. And if they have a female cub, that cub incorporates part of her home range into mom's. And it's a real staggered expansion of bears. And their reproductive potential is very, very low. Um, They have maybe a litter of two, maybe three cubs. Maybe only one of those is a female, and that's every two years. They don't even have cubs till they're two or three years old. So it's it's a very slow process. So combine that with their expansion rates of females. And even though we're seeing all these bears, you know, east of, excuse me, west of Daniel Boone, we're not seeing female bears. And often those bears that do turn up outside of their core range don't make it back. They get hit on the roadside. Um, they become, they get shot. They turn up missing for various reasons. So bears require a lot of of habitat with a low human density, not many people. That's why we see bears where we do. You either see them in the mountains or you see them in coastal areas that's swampy. And that's because those areas aren't developed to the extent that cities are. And they require a a tremendous fall food source because they have to pack on as much weight as possible. And when we get into the bluegrass and the Green River regions of Kentucky, that landscape just doesn't have the amount of acorns that you'll find in the mountains. And that's just flat out what it takes to make a bear population grow. What can I do or anyone do to help keep a bear from coming onto their property? Absolutely. Number one, do not feed a bear. That is the absolute worst thing you can do. And I take it that people aren't feeding bears anywhere, but they're, anyway, but they're doing it kind of accidentally. Well, you would think. You know, this summer we had reported cases and confirmed of people just pouring out corn on their porch just so they can watch the bears come up on their porch. It doesn't get more intentional than that. That's true. So there is actual intentional direct feeding of bears. Is that legal? No. Uh, The direct and indirect feeding of bears is illegal in Kentucky. Um, So that's something that you could be cited for. So if Um, I leave dog food out? Well, that's that's a little different. Your, your, Your intent there is to feed your pet. You're not intending to feed the bear. What's an unintentional feeding of bear? We have had instances where people visit state parks and smear peanut butter on trees and then leave and come back the next day hoping to see bears. Or they will go to Walmart and buy a day-old birthday cake and put it on a picnic table and just drive off and come back making loops hoping to see a bear. That's, you know, not necessarily, you're not going to catch them in the act, but that's the indirect feeding of bears, most certainly, uh, as opposed to them witnessing someone throwing a donut in a bear's mouth, Sure. Um, which we've seen that, too. It teaches bears that people are like a candy dispenser. I just walk up to them, and they give me food. Um, that's a horrible thing for a bear to learn, because they usually don't survive <laughs> that behavior. Um, it, it has an inherent fear of people. The longer it hangs around with people, and certainly if people initiate interaction with that bear, if they're feeding it, that bear learns that, hey, those two-legged creatures are, that are feeding me are pretty easy to get food from. So the, the feeding of bears is number one. Don't do that. The three other lures or attractants that we typically contend with, garbage, pet food, and bird feeders. If you can be mindful of those three things, you can really keep bears off of your property. Garbage is just an easy food source. It stinks. Bears can smell it from a mile away. They come check it out. Next thing you know, you have garbage thrown all over your yard. Not something anyone wants to deal with. And the same for pet food. You know, If you know you have bears in your area, just put out enough for one meal at a time. Don't dump the whole 20-pound bag out in a pan and leave it because that's just a buffet for a bear. <laughs> and bird feeders is just something that people often overlook. Don't even give it a second thought, but it's just like a little snack hanging there right in the yard. Any Final thoughts on bears? 
if you see a bear and you're you know, you're outside of the mountainous parts of Kentucky and you see a bear or hear about it, give us a call. Let us know. We'd like to confirm it, put it on a map so that we can track uh, where bears are showing up. And if you certainly have any kind of nuisance issues or bears getting into your garbage, before you take matters into your own hands, call us. We have people that work with our department that do an absolutely wonderful job out in the field um, addressing these human-bear conflicts. Do you text and drive, I guess, is the question we no. all want to know. No. That's a good band. Steve, you'll have to come back toward fall and talk about what bears are doing then. Yeah, we'll do it. I remember my mama always said, don't ever feed a bear because you'll never fill him up and he'll always come back for more. We are out of time. This is Charlie Baglin inviting you to come back in a week and we will go inside outdoors again. Right here on Kentucky Field Radio.